live in the mountains, we're people of the trees here. And the trees are very crucial and important to our way of life, to the culture that we're bringing forward. And what we're doing today is mixing our traditional cultures and that uh, way of honoring what we're doing and working with the earth, with the modern culture, with the community forests, where local people are working here, growing their families as well. So we're showing you how as a people, as a community, we can work together to bring about a better way of life to pass on to you because you are, all of you, the next generation that will inherit the earth. And now it is our responsibility to give this message, to give this way of educating you, and it's uh, eventually going to be your responsibility to pass that on to your children. And may you all uh, have a good day and a good life, Limlit, for all of you. Limlit. Yeah. Not too bad. Sweet grass, cedar very powerful herbs that are used in ceremony and for various reasons. Each one is representative of something different and all of them are very powerful in terms of native tradition. And because we're doing a prayer, we're going to uh, honor it. I just want to begin this uh, uh, video with a land acknowledgement and a personal acknowledgement to the Sinaix people whose territory we live in. And these were people who uh, were uh, dislocated in order to take their resources. And uh, it was during the time of dams and the time of coming in for, for mining and uh, there is a great potential here in the mountains. And unfortunately, they declared the Sinaiks ex extinct and they're still struggling going through so many court cases, costing so much money in order to come back from extinction and reclaim the land of their ancestors. So I've been able to 
come here in time to witness a lot of that and um, understand that colonialization had a lot to do with taking the resources and uh, taking the children away and holding them ransom for, um, for their potential uh, capacity to exploit those resources. And so here we are trying to reverse some of this and we've come, many of us, from many lands with the same problem and with the same cultural upheaval, whether we had to leave Europe or uh, leave this country or that country as refugees. And as we can see today in the world with wars and all the you know, fighting that is going on, we've become a planet of refugees. It's been an ongoing process, but uh, hopefully we can uh, solve something and uh, learn to live in peace and prosperity with the land, with the earth, and learn something from our ancestors as the Sinaiks too are trying to teach us. Today we're offering a prayer of gratitude for this tree that has sacrificed its, itself for, for all of us and for what we are going to do today. And so this is the tree that was cut yesterday by Jason, one of our fallers, and, um, and he was able to aim it because of his uh, expertise to land between these trees and not uh, affect any of the other taller trees so that they can continue living. During this time of the year, they would be harvesting the, 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 the skin of the tree, the cedar of the tree, and they would use all parts of it. And so uh, their way of doing it was to culturally modify a tree. And you can pull a strip off and it's like anything. If you go around the tree, uh, that kind of elevator-like process will be cut off from the bottom to the top and the tree will die. But if you pull uh, a strip off in a long line, and which we will do today, uh, that tree will continue to survive. And you can pull many strips off a tree. There's even one down in Vancouver Island where there's only a, a strip about that wide left, but the tree is still alive. Oh, oh. <laughs> there you go. Look at the size of that. that was a long one. Wow. Yeah. wow. Definitely. I know. Or no, why don't you all just carry it to the <laughs> next tree? Where do you want to grab and we'll a piece see of how the bark? long it is. If I don't, I'll just live through it probably. So. Are you sure? Okay, yeah. yeah. All right. Everyone grab a, grab on. Maybe I have granola bars and stuff. And when you get to the top, uh, when you instill, you're still showing. These trees uh, that have grown here for a very long time uh, know one another. Uh, many of these trees are the babies of older, old growth trees. When we look into nature, in terms of again our tradition that we see trees as very comparable to our lives and we see trees as families as plants are have families of their children their grandchildren that surround them where they're considered the elder ones are considered mother grandmother trees like anything in life we have at least four generations sometimes even more and they are all surrounding one another and present and it's the same with animals and it's the same with us in our life the that parallel uh, between generations and as i am sitting here today as an elder we look to the elder trees 
and some of the oldest trees we have are the cedar trees and uh, they're very special and when you go into uh, an old growth forest as you can see here uh, the the greenery that is growing here covers the land the moss it's uh, uh, it growing in the shade it's very damp condition and we have the um, privilege to be living in one of the uh, rare inland temperate rainforests on earth. The cedar is called in many different traditions including European tradition the tree of life. You can uh, see how many things are made from the cedar from canoes, from homes, uh, structures that different buildings, how the cedar floats and also one of the most valuable and important things that we have is the skin of the cedar tree. Lucky thing about cedar is that if you look here you'll see how the tree grows its fiber in long long strands and that's what makes it so easy and so um, good to harvest. We can then harvest and pull very long strand. If we clear it completely today, we can pull a strand all the way to the top of the tree. Now, if we can pull it off, we'll see. But uh, you have these long, long strands that you can afterwards separate. The older the tree, the thicker the, the cedar fi fiber will be. And if you look closely, you'll look here underneath. You see the outer bark, and right in here, is that inner cambium and it's uh, light skinned and it's uh, never seen the daylight and it's that's the part that um, is taking the nutrition from the roots at this time of the year and and bringing it up like an elevator all the way to the top to feed the leaves and so twice a year that that um, sort of sweet juice in a way that's inside the sap that's in in between the tree and the uh, skin of the tree is um, moving going up during the spring and that's the time that you can harvest the cedar and in the fall there's another period of time where the uh, sap will be going down and going back into the roots to help preserve uh, the the sugars for for, for the winter time as it goes dormant during the winter. So these are two very important times of the year. And um, when a tree is cut down, we think that's it, it's over with, but the whole forest reflects uh, uh, and knows when a tree's been cut down. And what this uh, uh, whole um, underground mycelium that's with the fungus and with all the roots of things that grow will try to bring nutrition to this tree and um, will help feed it through its roots so that it uh, today we're harvesting but this will eventually be a mother tree and a mother tree is what feeds other trees to grow and uh, as an elder they lay down their life for the next seed to grow. And that's why sometimes when you go into the forest, it's kind of bumpy. But if you look closely, you'll see where trees have fallen and where the earth has covered it and other trees have started to grow. And where there are what you call a nurse tree in that. And um, so we're going to honor this tree and I'm gonna pass this much around to all of you and um, take a pinch of it and we're going to place it around the, the roots of the tree and on the stump to honor this tree because it has given its life force to us and when you go out in nature and you're harvesting whether it's plants medicine food um, what you're harvesting is the life force in, in nature and feeding yourself with that life force and we grow families and everything because we cooperate and we work together 
And it's again like saying, uh, this is the web of life, that it isn't just about one person who's dictating how things should be, but it's about all of us learning to respect everything on that web because everything is conducive to our well-being, well-being of our communities and of our families. There are some smaller knives here, more a razor blade. I'm gonna put it down, I won't take a knife from you. It's just an old custom for me, my How did you do in the distance? I got like, okay. That's not bad. When my kids were young in New Denver, uh, my daughter was terrible about bringing uh, the orphaned or wounded animals to a very confusing house. We had a rut, and uh, all of a sudden this you. Uh, I found a wolf spider in my room once, and my friend was over. And she, we were just talking, he'll make his web in the screen. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Or is it Wednesday? She looks at me and sighs um. on her last breath and says, well, at least you were entertaining, she said to me. <laughs> and that's, I guess, what I am. Yeah. So here we go. So our very initial, and if it's really hard, and kind of glassy sometimes. We, um, it, it might be a bit difficult to scrape, but you try to come down hard at the beginning and you can see all this leftover and you get up and try to pull it as long as you can. And this kind of punky stuff was also used for stuffing mattresses and different things like that. And it helps keep the bugs away. The length of that, you guys. Like that? Yeah, yeah. All right, coming. I'm right, coming. Oh. Okay. Uh, with your draw knife, um, just to make sure it's always clean, and if it gets real sappy. I have oil, I and have um, and if it gets dull, a sharpener. I've got oil and 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 cloth to wipe it, so it, it just makes it easier. Now, when you come down to the skin, uh, you're doing it coming in thicker. How you bend your blade is important, and, and pull slowly when you get down to the skin, and you got to be careful at this stage, and so. You don't want to pull too much of the skin off because sometimes you can gouge it and it'll make this layer too thin. And so we're going to have thick, thin, thick, thin. But when you get to the skin here, then, then just glide it, glide it. Good then? Yeah. Can we do maybe just a little bit? Yeah. A little bit more? 
more. Just a little bit more. You see right here we've got some uh, kind of broken fiber but we're going to uh, cut a piece that's going to be uh, coming down like this and you got to come down um, really kind of hard that you're cutting into the wood. Can everybody see? Mm -hmm. Now we're going to pull it off the tree. And just to make sure we come down deep enough. It's a bit dry. Bring it all together. Now, someone who has a good eye for being straight is gonna go down the tree like this. Down the tree and hold your arm straight and keep coming down. Try not to deviate too much. And always look at the thickness that you're cutting hard to see the other side. Uh, just for some smaller cuts here. That looks good. Okay. Good. Keep it going. Keep it going. All of it. Go away. Nice. Good. breathing all by yourself. And pull. And then under and pull. And then someone is behind here and rolling so that it doesn't get fall in the dirt. This should be so much thicker. And the one thing about learning from our ancestors is learning how to live with the land, how to live with the earth, and, and find all that you need within a certain area surrounding you. And so basket weaving is just one of the things that you can find. And uh, you can learn a lot from the trees, from foraging for food, from hunting, from the water, uh, fishing, and uh, a bit of mining, a bit of uh, logging, and uh, so many things where you have a lot of diversity and not just a mono cultural way of t resource extraction and exploitation that you can uh, do many things like farming where there's certain times of the year that you're you're working hard and other times you're doing other things we become a sort of cult of machinery in a sense and now we have machines that can do so much in so little time. So many of us now just have jobs running machines and we're doing so much extraction of nature, just like modern day farming. And most of our profits go to sustain machinery instead of sustaining nature and one another. And we're coming to the finality of that. And we're starting to realize that we have to change in order to learn to sustain ourselves in a good way, in a healthy way that validates our lives, our, our, our working ethics, and takes us away from these electronic uh, devices that are you know, keeping us amused. And uh, the best part is putting the kids in nature, taking the kids out 
and to weave baskets. And I remember once, one year, uh, having a class called Eloise's School of Sorcery. And of course, there were certain religious people who were not thrilled with that title. But I said, no, it's to take them to the source. My name is Eloise Charette Calles, and um, I was born in Quebec. And um, when I think of who am I, and I'm just a, a Métis mix in a way of many traditions, from uh, Irish to French to uh, First Nations, and all those traditions influenced me and influenced my childhood and uh, growing up in Quebec. and. Also, uh, the division of language in Quebec, never mind our First Nations language or the Inuit. So uh, all that left its kind of influence on me of the difficulties of colonialism, per se. And, um, but the one thing uh, later on, what I became in life was a cashier to a waitress to so many different titles. but. Nothing ever stuck and nothing stayed for long. And in the end, the thing, the greatest thing I've been is a daughter, a, a sister, and then an aunt and uncle, and then a mother in my own right. I became a mother, a grandmother, and today I'm an elder. Uh, this is a, a cutter, but sometimes we call it the stripper. Everybody loves that word. And, um, and this will be to uh, cut our long pieces that we've already kind of taken the bark off the tree. And it's just um, a handy uh, to have this kind of uh, uh, splitter to uh, process our cedar and um, make it, uh, uh, these are little cubes we put in to give us uh, the length, that, uh, the fatness of the strips that we want to weave a basket. So we have different size cubes for different things that we can need. Uh, we're gonna need like ties. Uh, we're gonna need fatter pieces sometime, smaller pieces. So you decide what you want to put in, uh, the size of the ones you want to put in. Uh, it all actually started when I, after I got arrested for my watershed. And I told the kids, I have nothing to leave you, but I'll try and leave you pure water. And everybody was screaming about the clear cutting of our, our forests and, and, you know, and for me, what worried me was how it was affecting our water. And that water was for everybody. And I told my children, I have nothing to leave you, but I'll try and leave you pure water. And that's for everybody and the animals and the trees and the plants and, so on, because I never saw my my legacy as something narrow. I saw it as a bro on a broader spectrum. And so uh, it, afterwards, during the process, I should say, is that uh, many of the loggers were, uh, you know, screaming that logging feeds their family. And so I thought, well, I, you know, we are people of the trees here in the mountains and uh, what can I do to be part of it? And so we brought in someone to show us some uh, about weaving and my sister didn't feel comfortable with the teacher and we had to leave right away. So we only learned the, the, the base of, of a basket, not much, but we never kind of put it up into a basket. So we went home with whatever fiber we had and my sister went into the bathroom and brought the waste paper basket out, turned it upside down and said, there, we'll just see what we can do. You always keep your first basket. The rest can be giveaway and so on, but you always keep your first basket. And this is the first basket that I wove and I've kept it 
It's one of the few baskets that I have. Very proud of it. And when other people saw it, they said, whoa, that's pretty good for your first basket. And I said, it reminds me of, of a chest, a woman's chest in a way, and uh, like torso. And um, yeah, that was it. And that's what we made. Didn't quite look like the waste paper basket, but it passed as something to use. And I was so proud of myself. And so was my sister. So that's how it all began with me. I said, I always feel like I'm the person who comes in through the exit, you know. And I had to learn. That's how I, why I said to the young people the other day, I learned through my hands. And my hands had that ancestral cellular memory somehow. I, I really loved it. And I had sat with basket weavers all around the world, but never thought I would pick it up myself and so it, it kind of chose me as well and I just uh, learned and learned and and made mistakes and had to redo it sometimes over and over but it was all a teaching and I just got better and better and then I started selling baskets and then I realized how much time it took and I would do like 10 hours worth of basket collecting and then weaving and be selling it for $30 or $40 if I was lucky. And sometimes I would get old growth trees that they had cut down and I felt so sorry for the old growth and I could hardly wrap my legs around it. But some of the trees were 800 year olds, 1,000 year olds, and you'd be weaving with that, selling it for next to nothing and feeling, you know, that uh, it took 800 years for that, that tree to grow. And, uh, you know, at least with the baskets, you're, you're holding, you're remembering, you're holding that time span. And for me, the cedars were ancient, were wise. They lived through how many of our generation? It's unbelievable. They're our teachers, you know, what do they know? What do they, see and remember. And so even holding that tissue in my hand was, uh, you know, a remembering as well, you know, and feeling it through them and honoring them in the best way I could. So that's how it all began. And then eventually uh, it took off more and more. I was making hats and I became better known. And what we didn't have any kind of official basket, traditional basket weavers, like there's so many on the coast of British Columbia. And for me, being inland was uh, uh, just trying to learn on my own, do the best I could. And, and what was good for me was that I could bring something different, bring novelty uh, to the art, and so when I would go visit some of the reserves on the coast with my hats and my baskets, they would take all my hats and baskets because they said they're different. And so that's how I started to recognize how um, we're, we're all unique in our own way. Even with the traditionalists, they have some different styles and they integrate different fibers as well. So you're starting to see more diversity but it wasn't until Truth and Reconciliation that we became uh, more and more recognized, more validated, and that we started to become part of the schooling system and part of the teachings at the school. Uh, this is uh, called splitting, and uh, the bottom of the tree is always the thickest, and it thins out as it goes to the top of the tree. The north side, the side that's not facing the sun, is usually thicker than the side that's facing the sun and so after we've cut our strip we have um this one's sort of thin in a way i'm not at the bottom part of the tree but it's enough for for our ability to show that you're going to come right here right down the middle of the fibers because that's the thing with the cedar is their long, tall fibers. 
and we're going to cut and it's important that you have it cut straight to give you an idea and now we're splitting we're going to separate the two and these will be more of our weavers and it's uh you feel it with your hands when it's thinning out too much on one side it's important to keep stay in the middle as much as possible the older the tree the thicker the fiber will be um, so sometimes you can split them into two usually but you can split it into three sometimes and even four depending on the thickness and the age and the position on the tree so this is splitting the fiber sometimes you want your ribs the the part of the baskets that is going to be holding up the basket the ribs on the side sometimes you want them thicker but the weaver you sometimes you want it thinner depending on um, uh, again the age of the tree and the thickness and uh, the weavers can be thinner thinner but the ribs have to be strong Sometimes when you get to the top, it thins out too much. It's not worth doing. Sometimes people dig too deep. It's hard when you're teaching students or beginners. They kind of dig in deep and then it'll thin out too much. But where it's too thin, sometimes you have to just cut that off. So I'm going to just cut it here and save this piece for maybe a rib or something. Put that aside for after. But there's your two strands. And that's what you're going to hang and dry and uh, we'll be ready for weaving later on. And you always roll them a little loose, never tight tight, so they have a bit of air in between. Often everybody would say, oh, you're an activist, or call me an activist, or, or, you know, and I said, oh, no, no, if I can sit down and be lazy, I'll do it. I'm a pacifist, and I'm proud of who I am. And when I, you know, I've gotten arrested or whatever, it's kind of almost like a religious theme, you know, where I'm, I'm giving myself, I'm giving of myself. I'm making that sacrifice, sacred offering of what I am, who I am, to in your, into your arms and delivering myself and that I'm proud for what I'm standing for. And, and for me, all of life is important and it's the trees, but it's, it's everything around the trees because we need a healthy ecosystem to even grow a tree, to grow a child. I'm a mother and a grandmother and now an elder and uh, it's my job. And this is the job that I have to sustain life. And as an elder now, it's important that I think of those next generations to come. And every generation should make it better. And so I tell the young ones of today, don't get mad. Uh, you know, be proud. Be proud of who you are. Stand firm. Hold your beliefs up. Because faith is, is, a, is a, a great thing. It'll give you that extra piece of courage you need to stand up, to hold strong, to make that choice and that decision to, to go without any expectations or without knowing the outcome. And that's how I started, you know, not knowing, you know, that they would take me away, you know, because I refused to sign the undertaking of my release. The judge told me, well, you can sign here and then you uh, you get to go home till your court day. Uh but you have to abide by our code that you're you're not allowed to return to your watershed and to stand against the logging in your watershed and i said you know i'll always stand against the logging in my watershed so you might as well take me now and so for me making that decision uh and then learning afterwards 
uh, as I went through court, after spending months in jail and fasting and everything, business rules over life, that we had no, no strength to stand up as people in our community, as families, for ourselves and for our community. And that the business of the government, the resource extraction, boom and bust, uh, is more important than life itself. And that's what going to court taught me. And that's what decolonization is in a way, is to change this pyramid style government where we elect the few to lead the many. And it's time we go to the circle where the many participate to truly become a, a good democracy. We need the participation of everybody together and to think of the animals, the trees, the water, and everything around us that sustains us. So I tell the young today, you know, I'm here to give you hope. I'm here to give you uh, honor. I'm here to help validate your integrity. Hold your head high. Be proud of who you are, and you can be anything you want. You don't have to carry everybody else's titles. Carry yourself with honor and pride over who you are and walk that line where you know the difference between good and not good and not so good and evil and perversion and what, what is gonna count that can be passed on as a living legacy, not a dead one. And so that to me is my teaching, is my piece that I can hand over and to give hope for the next generation. And our greatest responsibility is to be an example, an example for others. And that in the end is what I become, an example for others in a life that's worth living because all I have at the end of the day is my story. And I lived for the things that counted for me in life. And it wasn't money, it wasn't glory, it wasn't power, but it was a lot of love. And love is everything. I'm grateful to live in a place that still has enough remnants of nature, in a place that, what I call in the Kootenays, the watersheds of, of this land that we call Canada, in a place that nourishes with water. It's a rainforest, the only rare inland temperate rainforest on earth that uh, I see all we do here is make clouds. We get so much rain and moss and fungi, and uh, it's a very special place to live. And we get to swim in these lakes that are glacial cold, and yet the glaciers are melting, so we do have to worry. And now we're, you know, starting to see the climate shifting and changing. So it's very important that we recognize that and that we start changing in order to adapt because adapting is probably the most important thing we can do now, is to adapt to nature, not adapt nature to ourselves. For me, it's to inspire, and uh, to in inspire means in spirit, to pass on that spirit of wanting to do it, 
wanting to get outside, turning off your cell phone and being in nature. And like I say, silence yourself and listen to the silence. When do we hear silence? And just stop thinking, stop, you know, worrying about things and just sit in nature and be open and open all your senses to nature. So now we're also beginning the process of lining up our, our, our fibers that I've already cut and prepared for this uh, very moment in time. In the beginning of the process, we'll be, make sure that they are strong, your fiber, that they're going to uh, the stronger ones because they're the uh, going to be the ribs of, of your basket so we make sure they're they're very strong they're not weak because the ribs are going to be the support structure of the basket and uh, these longer ones will be the weaver that we weave around and they don't need to be as strong as the ribs so. You start off with looking at your colors and the way you want to line up the light or the dark and what kind of patterns you want to make uh, in order to weave and how many light and dark you have. And some are a, a double weave and they're light and some uh, are are already separated because they were so thick and just make sure you're you're you've got your colors in alignment and the strength that they have and and then for a middle um, if they're thick, if they're thin, all that is important. So we're going to begin with, I'd like to create a bit of a pattern here. And um, I'm going to put my thickest ones towards the center because they're, um, uh, especially this one here, um, I'm gonna think of where my middle is gonna be and how I want it to be in alignment with uh, with one another so that my basket is even. So I start with the middle and then I'm going to come underneath here. And over and knock these, these in. And then I'm going to another piece here and another piece on the side here Beneath. and this is the very beginning of the basket I'm going to add a dark one here just to make a contrast in my basket. Another, and once you've aligned these fibers, 
the next one you're aligning are the ones that are going to be your weavers as you can see some are a bit longer but we'll cut that later on and then I'm going to put a couple of light ones here and you got to always make sure your corners are have some of the strongest ribs because uh, it's the corners are always very important that they be strong and you pull this up and up in order to align them properly with the ones that are beneath and then I've got a very small one here but um, I don't know if I'm going to put these on the side or not because they're smaller and they're they're kind of thick you see these are the ribs on the side here these are the ribs and um, this is the base that we're weaving right now and so we're just going to put this base down which will be the bottom of our basket to weave around and around and um, my basket's going to be a little more rectangular um, just because I'm adding these two again for contrast um, just what I feel like doing right now and uh, it'll kind of shorten this side here but we'll cut the lengths to be equal in the end so I've got the four corners and I'm going to pin them pin them and hold them down so that uh, they hold so that I can find a, a string to go around a thinner piece to go around and this is the piece I will be looking for this string like piece that will tie them all together and those are crucial pieces in beginning your basket and they're usually very small and they'll be tight and that's uh, often uh, what we were looking for and these you can cut by hand prior to beginning and then you want to make sure that this string goes like one and a half times around your basket to make sure you have enough of the string and we're going to begin uh, in the middle by uh, starting the weave here at the top and then pretty well in the middle and uh, putting hooking it on there and then going around and the reason again you're doing this these are like your fingers sticking out your ribs and uh, you're going to take that come down like that uh, and then fold over next fold over next fold over and as you can see it's going to tie it so that it holds properly and it, it'll be nice and tight and after that it will set the base of your basket and add to the strength of holding it together and so when you uh, cut these you pull on them and stretch them to see that they're strong enough to hold and uh, it'll be at the base of your basket to hold your fibers your ribs together and so we're going to start and we twist and this is sometimes one of the hardest parts for someone to learn or to do and this is when we put our our postings aside and we arrive at a corner and at the corner we're going to do a double twist one and two because when you're 
starting and I'll show you I'm going to turn this and when you're starting your basket you need a little more space on the corners when you're folding it up to go up because there's always a little bit more space on the corners these are are in alignment and these are when the corners have come up and you need that little bit of space in between them to uh, help them to fold upwards to make your corner. So we're going to do this and then we're going to come across here with our tie and twist, twist, one under, one over, one under, one over, one under, one over, one under, one over, over, under, over, under, over, under, over. And then you reach your corner again. You're going to uh, turn it. Separate those fibers, and then you're coming again to the corner. Double twist, double twist, and then and you can see there's a, a little wedge there. And over, under, over. Always make sure your your rope is like nice and parallel on the side. We remove this one too, the clothes didn't put it aside. Double twist on the corner. Under, over, under, over, under, over. Under, over, over, under, over, last clothespin, turn, the front under double twist under over under over now we've reached where we meet with the very beginning of our weave and what you want to do now is go to the what's going to be the inside of your basket and you're going to Hook this piece onto here, onto here like this, and pull it through, and pull, and then twist this over, and pull it through, and you're going to pull it through and come all the way under here. And if you have a hard time, just a sec, if you have a hard time putting this through here, you can use a spoon to prop open. Uh, it's, the spoons are narrow at the base to be able to fit in between. It's not too bad because I have uh, wide uh, ribs, but sometimes you have narrow ribs and you wanna have it as narrow as par possible. Now you're in between, you're going under to kind of hide this. Now make sure you're nice and tight. Everything's good. And then this one here as well will go under. So both of them will be camouflaged underneath and they you won't see this on the outside. This is going to be the inside of the basket and you want to hide these pieces and there you go. Now this is tight enough to throw it 
make sure it's moist enough. If not, take a spray bottle or soak it in water, shake it, and get ready for your next step. Make sure, because in the movement sometimes, some get a little shorter. Make sure they're all lining up. On the sides. Pretty well. Pretty good. So, seeing that this is going to be my the sides of my basket, I'm going to begin on either one of these sides and start my process. And it will be to cut one of the stronger ribs um, that can afford to be cut because we're only going to cut one side. And that's because we're going to start from one side. It could be the middle as well, but my middle one isn't as strong as my side one. So I'm going to start with a side one here. Never start on a corner because that'll make your corner weak and it'll cause more difficulties for you in the longer process. So you cut one, and the reason for cutting it, uh, usually you thin this one out to equal, or you thicken this one to be larger. But again, it's about balancing your, your basket. And that's why we do these on the side as well. And this is how you're going to begin. Um, and the reason for this is to make all of this instead of even, because lining it up this way makes all your fiber even. And we have to make an odd one. Otherwise, the second row, when you come through, will be the exact identical to the first. And we want one to help skip over and uh, change the next row that you're going to do and the third row and the fourth row. So we need a, an odd number instead of an even number on your basket. And so this is when you're going to look to find a weaver that you're going to use to uh, weave around your basket. And because I'm using larger pieces, the one I just split will probably be a nice weaver and it'll be light colored because I just want to do it light colored. So this is the weaver I'm going to choose and this is the place I'm going to begin where I've cut double. And because I'm right handed I'm going to go this way and um, I'm going to start it. This is really important here. begin your basket with uh, a bit of a, a, a sort of ascendant kind of quality to the fiber so that it's not completely um, completely whole until you reach a certain level because uh, when you're going to finish you're going to do the same kind of uh, cut to make sure that it um, it uh, will balance your basket and so these are this is the way it's going to start and so here's where the spoon again comes in handy oh I know I had a spoon here somewhere here's the knife oh thanks Lita so <coughs> I'm going to lift that up in order to bring this over and to be able to balance it. This, and this is when you're going to start. The, the, putting in your weaver and what you're going to do at the beginning is put a a safety a, a pin, a clothes pin on it 
and then round it on the corner and this is when you're going to fold it and often you can use uh, a mold inside and it'll help you not uh, mix all your ribs together and drive you crazy and that helps too it makes it it just makes things easier and then you're gonna but i often don't because i could I always have so many mix match um, uh, shapes that um, I gave up on putting molds in. But if you look at a lot of the traditional teachings, they'll have molds to get just the right shape that they want. And you can cut your fat fiber to fit the right shape. And like I say, make it easier on you. So as you can see, the first row has been laid and we're going to not pin no pins on the corners because we already have a bit of um, a bit of extra length on the corners to be able to make your corner come in as tight as you can and uh, and just keep going over under over under and right here is a piece that I didn't notice before and always make sure that your fiber is well cut and no pieces hanging out like what we're seeing right now. And again, pull nicely to round that corner without pulling too tight and then usually around the middle fiber, add your clothespin and then come around to the next corner and again bend over, under, put your clothespin in, check your corner, over, under, come around this corner again, come around here, come around here and here's where we start we see this is where we began. Make sure you pull up the two ribs that were separated early and bring. make sure you're bringing those in. And here's where you can again slide your clothespin in the middle, come around and then come around. And there's your, once your second your second weaver, second row of weaver, of weaving weavers is laid. The basket weaving will become much easier, as you can see. Again, use your clothespins, come around. Pull your ribs, pull your ribs to make sure you're in nice straight alignment. Pull your ribs and without a form underneath is when we can make our weavers that much tighter. And always think about there'll be a bit of shrinking when it dries and you want to kind of bring it in tight. And as you can see, the weaver is coming through on the second row. And like I say, the second row is what locks the form of your basket in. And once you've completed it, it'll be so much easier to be able to keep rounding off your basket to put that weaver in. Just keep turning, weaving it around. Turning and weaving, turning and weaving. Now you can really see the basket really, really taking shape more and more. It's easier. Pull, tighten, in, over, under, pull, tighten, over, under, around, 
and around. And we can see the contrast in the basket as well with the colors that we put, the light and dark. And here, this is where sometimes it's like, how come I skipped it? They, these are big uh, ribs, so it makes it easier. Easier to see, easier for teaching as well, but also just easier to weave. It's the finer stuff that takes more time. see here is where I began and this is how I'm going to end it so I'm gonna cut this here I'll give myself a, a longer place to and you can see I'm ending it at the same angle coming in like this This is going to show on the outside, so I want to make sure it's as nice a cut as possible. And so there's your on the outside. This is going to come in here, and then this is here is going to come in as well, like this. And then I'm going to tuck it in at the back here, all the way to here. And you can see the downwards uh, angle that I'm going to tuck it in with. And then, as you can see, this will be tucked in further. And this is where I'm going to end my, uh, my uh, weav weaver. And then I'm going to take what we call str the string the tie part, the ties that are going to hold it together, making sure I have one and a half, which I do. I have more than one and a half, which is ample, ample fiber. So I won't be using it all. I'll just be using a segment of it. And I'm going to come in uh, by folding it in half and coming down on this side and it's the same as the bottom that we did, under, over, under, over. And the top one is very important that it look good, that it look nice, because that's uh, a really important part that will be visible for, for your ending. Whereas the bottom part doesn't have to be so visible. It'll be sort of tucked underneath in the flat bottom of your basket. So this is my ties that end it and are going to make my folding over easier. And there's different ways of doing this. There's uh, so many different ways for different themes that you want as a finishing touch. But this way, this for me, is one of the neatest and tightest and uh, is, is very nice, nice finishing on a basket. There, tucked under, over, game twist.
now we're coming to the end and it's the same as what we had at the beginning and I'm going to cut this a little shorter so it won't be so difficult to put through and this one as well so these are the two pieces that are going to be tucked into the inside like this and you hook it on to the piece that you already started with and you're going to turn it this way and you're going to twist this one as well under and uh, over and then you do it on the second rung here so that you can tuck it into the next piece. Take my spoon out and it can go in there and uh, tuck it under, tuck it under to go underneath like that, underneath, and underneath like that. So they're tucked right under and they're going to pull here and then pull this piece as well. And flatten it with your fingers after. And flatten it. And then we're going to cut where it won't show. And there you go. See? I've got a bit of a bump here. That could have been pulled a little tighter. But uh, it's all looking good. And now we're completely uh, done with the height of the basket and the process of uh, weaving. And now we're doing the finishing touch. And so I've evened out most of the fiber on here. And remember your basket will be the height of the lowest one. So um, what I've done here, as you can see, I've cut them, it can be to the side or it can be in a point <clears throat> and that's in order to tuck them in and we're not finished yet but we're just going to do the cuts on them and to either point in whatever direction or however you want but not cut them at the top just cut them on the sides you want the length of the basket here They're all trimmed at the top in order for us to be, start the process of tucking them in. Now we're going to look for a nice thick piece in here. Nice and thick. Very thick. And this is going to go inside our basket. So we have to check how long it's going to be. And always add a bit of extra length. It's always handy to have. But it'll be shorter because it'll be lesser than that. Because we're going to uh, put it on the inside. Again, cedar to cedar. And... Uh, we're grateful for all the cedar we're using. And so I'm going to cut this back a bit just because it's going to fold up onto the next part and I don't want it to be bubbling up in a way. 
I want them to fit well together. And so I'm going to uh, just cut in a bit, cut in and remove some of this extra width to thin it out a little. And so, again, let's always have the finishing part to the side, which is always handy dandy. And we're going to tuck this basket in, back to getting my clothespins in. We're going to start with one, and as you can see, there's um, inside is a uh, is a uh, hard to show, but inside is a short one and a long one because of the weave, like this part here, we're uh, going to tuck it only under that thick side, and this part here will get tucked into the second rung. I'll try to remember that. So this is, uh, if you look here, you'll see this one, uh, this one here being tucked into the second rung. Get the spoon out, go in, under, and tuck in until it comes out the other side. I'll push it up a bit more with the spoon to make sure it's going in. I see it coming out the other side. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to pull, pull, pull it down. As you can see, it's pulled right down where it's uh, completely pulling that fiber in and under. This is going to go under and the one on the other side of it is going to go under as well. So one over and one under. And this is one of the reasons that we're using this uh, uh, piece here. It's going to add a thickness to the top of our basket and a strength because many people will pick up the basket from the side. And you can see we can cut this later, but I just feel like cutting it now. And then later we're going to come in and pull this even tighter at the end. So you can see the process of what we're doing now. This one here, like the one before, is we're skipping, pull, pushing up like that, pull, pull, tighten it, to make sure you're tighten it, tightening it from the base as well, and push it in. Push it in. Sometimes you gotta wiggle the spoon a bit to get it in. Get in there and pull down, pull down. And pull down. And you can see the process that we began. Now the next one's gonna come over. Pull tight that you're tightening it from the bottom up and then tuck it in underneath there. So we're only having to go through one, out of, one under, one over, and it's kind of making our process a little easier. Now tuck it in, tuck it in, get in there, pull that down as much as you can, and then go to the next one. This one's going to come under, under and over and here we're going to tuck it in it's really hard to see because it's very much on the inside pull tight tuck it in tuck it in It's, 
it's it's working okay and that's because I've had to this is where we began and where we've ended our our string like fiber and you can already see the beginning of the ending of our baskets you can already see how again the strength from the top and the strength the tightness as we go down the basket <coughs> and uh, we continue this process of tucking under and you can see this one has split so we're going to do it in two two segments in a way to tuck it under tuck both pieces under as much as we can sometimes you have to cut them or put, maybe I'm going to put this one underneath coming to the end and I'm trimming this end part uh, I trim this part here where it's uh, I'm gonna cut this off because we don't want is we want equal thickness but not too much thickness because it'll kind of make a, a bump in a way and we don't want bumps too many bumps and then here too I'm gonna trim it down from underneath so it won't show so much and this is being it will be hidden so it won't need to uh, look perfect so I've left out the ones we're gonna tuck tuck over and I've kept in the ones we're gonna tuck under. This one has come loose over here in the corner. I can pull this in, get in there, pull it down. Now remember, pull tight there. Come up, grab your spoon, come up over, over, under, go under. Get in there, pull it down as tight as you can. And then this one here, I didn't pull tight, so I can do it now. Pull tight from the bottom up. Tuck it under, just tuck it under that, this uh, rung we put in. Under, and then tuck it over. Then tuck it over. And as you can see, our last piece here is going to cover where we've cut in there in order to in, in order to tuck this in. Once you've cut them, you won't be able to to do much after that because it's the ending of your basket right inside. So I don't know if you can see from far away, but uh, what you can see mainly is that the basket now is finished. There's just going to be some threads uh, that need uh, cutting. Some people sometimes take a lighter and light those threads up. And um, you can tell that, oh, here's one cut. I didn't quite do it. But uh, even from inside, it looks good from outside and from inside. And you can see the pattern that I started with um, and the pattern of the corners and then the sides and uh, how this basket is um, its own uh, work of art. And uh, I feel good for the hours that were put in and for all this work and for all that we for being in the old growth and sitting here amongst the old growth trees 
doing something that is very special, like weaving a basket and reminding them how precious they are to us and how much we uh, value them in our lives and having a basket to take home, the smell of it, it always reminds me of the cedar, of the the trees that we har the tree we harvested, the young people that were on it, the help people who helped me teach the weaving of the basket to the young people of the classroom of the Nikas classroom, and also um, uh, being here now again among the street cedars to to sit here. I feel, I feel very blessed, very um, grateful for all that I have and for the skills of the, that the cedars who have come into my dreams and helped me and taught me a lot about their wisdom. And uh, it, I have something to pass on to the next generation as they have been standing over us watching us over many, many generations. Limlet, I feel very blessed today. When you're finished your basket, and you're swelling and your chest is swelling with pride, um, you uh, can fill it with um, um, towels or whatever and to put a weight on top of it and that will help and, and shape it so because it's still wet and damp and to help keep its shape. As I said when I began this will be rectangular and then you can also if you want to make sure your top is flat and your bottom is flat, you can put a weight on it, uh, just a mild weight to push this down and it'll help even out uh, your, your top part and um, it uh, will help you keep all your uh, ribs that you've tucked in in place. So that's the final duty. Uh, and sometimes you can just leave it the way it is and uh, stare at it for the next few weeks and months and years to come. Somehow you make your life, you carve your life, and you become somebody and uh, what's important is to be someone to your community, to uh, wherever you live, wherever you go, to be helpful, to be of service, to be kind. And those are the things I carried with me all my life. And now, like I say, I still relate very highly to the common person. I, I don't uh, feel I have to attain any great peaks. I um, cherish my uh, community, my, the nation and the place where I live and uh, cherish the world that is so much part of my life and nature, mother nature, planet earth and that's it.